This episode of Fishing Gurus is in association with Shimano, Gen X Pulse. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Fishing Gurus. I'm Wendy Lithgow and we're here at one of British Waterways prolific venues, Boddington Reservoir. We have got an awesome method for you today. We've got the bagging waggler, which is one of my favourite methods. We're joined by our very own fishing guru, Alex Bones. And then later on in the show, we're joined by another mega angler, Mick Bull, who's going to give us a little bit of a twist on the method. Right, let's get started. <music> So Alex, bagging waggler has got to be one of my favourite methods and it's so easy. I mean, what kind of venues is it suitable for? I mean, where we are today is a big reservoir. It's ideal for these sort of large waters, particularly where you've got quite a lot of depth to play with. Out there in front of us today, we've got sort of 10 to 12 foot, which is ideal. We've got loads of area to, to use, basically. And what about the conditions? Well, like we've got today, fortunately, blessed with a nice bit of sunshine, a um, bit of warm weather. It has gone a bit chilly lately, but it's ideal for fishing in the summer when the fish want to feed up in the water. So great summer method then, basically. Yeah. So how did it come about anyway, this method? They were fishing with big wagglers uh, and firing balls of ground bait at the float. They noticed that when the, when the ground bait hit the float, they were getting a bite. Some clever soul attached the method feeder to a pike float, suspended it below, consequently won the match. It then developed from there. Um, took it one step further and attached the float to the actual feeder to suspend the bait right up in the water. So it's pretty simple then really, isn't it? It's just a natural sort of progression. Exactly. It's like most things in angling. It's just developed into what now looks like a simple method. Yeah, so how does it work exactly then? So you've got the float, you've got the method. Well, that's the key thing and that's the reason why the bagging waggler can be so devastatingly effective. What you've got is your ground bait held inches beneath the surface. On impact, what you're looking for is the bait to explode off the feeder, basically creating a cloud up in the water that draws the fish in. You've then got a hook length. You can vary the hook length between sort of two foot, six foot, and it, that basically falls through the cloud as the fish come in, bang, take the bait, fish on. Well, bait's obviously the crucial element here. Let's go and have a look. Now, Alex, I know from experience, bait is probably the most crucial part of fishing the bag and waggler. Talk us through what mix you're using today. Well, for a bag and waggler session, you're going to need about four kilos of mix. I actually use four different ingredients, three of those being ground baits. The first one is MV Original Hemp and Halibut. This is packed full of crushed hemp and crushed pellets. It's a really attractive mix, but that hemp gives it loads and loads of fizz in the water. It's really active. Yeah, mix. which yeah. is what you want to help it come off the frame. Yeah. So, so that's two kilo in there then? There's two kilo that to start with. The second ingredient is a kilo of mojo. But the beauty about this mix is that when it's wet, it's very soft. So when it, on impact with the water, it clouds, which is exactly what we want with a bagging waggler. So that'll help, help it break down a little bit as well then? Yeah, helps yeah. the mix come off the frame. The third ingredient, and to make sure the day's not too expensive, is just to bulk it out with a bit of brown crumb. Trusty so, brown crumb. Yeah. yeah. That also, as, as well as bulking the mix out and, and stretching your money a bit further, it does also have another purpose. It's very soft and again, does a similar job to the mojo and helps it come off the frame. Yeah. There is a fourth ingredient, but I'll come on to that after I've mixed this. It's really important to blend the dry ingredients first. You'll notice that I actually use a high power drill. Yeah, to it's do a lot that. easier than getting your hands in, isn't it? Well, four kilos, once it's wet, it's a lot of mix to throw around, so it just makes the job a lot simpler. Not necessary, but it just helps. Yeah, if you didn't have a drill, how else could you mix it? Just, just, just by hand, just make and sure. It. I mean, if you, if you go right to the bottom of the bucket, make sure everything's all even, exactly as that is. Next stage is the water. I've got about three pints here. The thing, the thing with this is just a case of adding a little bit at a time, keep working the mix, keep drilling it, make sure it's nice and even. So 
So it's just a case of going steady, leave it to stand for a few minutes. As it happens, that's about perfect. You'll see a small ball forms nicely in my hand, nice and soft, on impact with the water, that's going to break down. Brilliant. Now, This will take on quite a bit of water though, wouldn't it? Would you like it to stand and then mix it again? Yeah, that's perfect for now. Leave it 10 minutes, maybe while I tackle it, um, and then revisit it, have a little look. What I'm looking for is it just nice, quite dry, just like that. Would you not do this the night before? Generally speaking, I like to do it on the bank. Um, we've had to walk a long way today, so it's easier to carry yeah. it dry. Um, and it's just, I think it's easier just to get, get the mix perfect when you're by the lakeside. So what about this fourth ingredient? Because I notice you've got one of these crusher things here. Well, the fourth ingredient is one I regard as the secret. Basically, it's nothing more complicated than a few crushed up six mil expander pellets, which float when they're dry anyway. So what's the thinking behind these then? What do these do? Basically, once these are crushed down, these are mixed into the ground bait, these will still float. Because the ground bait's already wet, these are dry, help keep the fish in the upper layers. How many would you put into a mix? Um, about two, about two crusherfuls right. for, for a four kilo mix. So that's about two handfuls, is it? Yeah, so see what you've got there, loads of tiny particles. They'll float, keep the fish up in the water right where I want them. And that looks perfect, ready to go. Well, Alex, that's a top mix. Thanks for insight into your bait. Now, onto the rig. The rig I use is simple and robust. As you can imagine, bagging waggler fishing puts a lot of strain on your kit. So to start with, I've spooled up my reel with 10 pound drag line, which is a really durable mono. Onto the end of the line, I've threaded an anti-tangle sleeve, and then I've tied on a size 11 ring swivel. Onto the bottom of my bagging waggler, I've got a link clip and swivel to allow me to change the floats quickly. And it's this link clip and swivel that affixes over the top of the anti-tangle sleeve to create a safe semi-fixed setup. The float's quite unique in itself as well. We've got a long bolsa body weighted at the bottom and you'll also see I've added a little bit of my own weight but we'll come on to that in a moment. The hook length is 025mm end gauge which breaks at about 12 pounds. I've attached this to the ring swivel with a figure of eight loop. To start today's session, I'm gonna use a five foot hook length but I can adapt things as the session progresses if I need to. On the business end, I've got a size 12 QM1 attached with a knotless knot. And on the end there, you'll see that I've got a bit of a special arrangement known as a bayonet. This is a really simple way of attaching pellets and boilies quickly, which is exactly what you need for the bagging waggler. Well, I've just heard one roll behind me, so I'm going to get cracking. Earlier, I touched on using a bayonet to attach your hook bait. It's a really simple job to make one for yourself. All you need to do is get a small eyed hook, in this case a size 16, and break it off at the base of the shank, right on the bend. What you'll be left with is a small spike with a slight kink in the end. It's then a simple case of pushing the bayonet inside the bait. Essential when speed's the key. This episode of Fishing Gurus is in association with Shimano Gen X Poles. Welcome back. Now, as we know, methods evolve in fishing and the bagging wag is no exception. We're joined now by Mick Bull, who's going to show us the sinking bagging wag. Now, this is a method that's new to me too, so let's go and take a look. So Mick, we've got this sinking bagging wag here. Yeah. Now, how is this different to the conventional bagging wag that we've been talking to Alex about? Well, really, just as it says, you know, it, it sinks, but there's, there's tricks in getting it so it sinks really, really slowly just by adding small pieces of lead. You know, what you have to do is you have to um, add a small piece of lead and uh, keep trying the float in the side and just to see where it sits. So you're shutting it right down then, basically? Depending on the style of the float, if you've got a pointed float like this, it, it sinks much quicker than what a round top will do. Um, so on this one, we set it to about here, with some ground bait around it, and that sinks really, really slow. Really? So how did this method come about then? I think it came about from, from Clattica originally. One of the locals sort of like got onto it and uh, started bagging up on it. Um, but it's really, it's a really good method. So is this, is this sort of style of fishing? Would you prefer this over the way that Alex is fishing? No, not always. No, um, 
it depends on how on, on the day and how they're having it. Um, the beauty that you've got with this type of flow is you cast it in, obviously, and it, it starts sinking really slowly. It goes to the bottom. When, you, when your ground bait is, has eventually come off it, your float comes back up. So therefore, you've got your bait going down in the water and you've got it coming back up. Once it's, once it's come back up, your ground bait's off it, so it's time to wind it back in. Oh, so it's a good indicator then, isn't yeah, it? it? Is, yeah, it is, So, you know, you've, when you've got to cast out again. Yeah, that's right. Brilliant. So, when are the conditions right for this method then? Well, sometimes when it's really windy, you know, it, it obviously it helps a sinking bait, it helps sinking your nylon as well. Um, so, it, it works really good in the wind when, when obviously a floating one's being towed along the pool. So this one's just stationary, yeah. pretty much in, yeah. in the swim. Yeah, obviously it will move a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's a really good method for that. Now we've seen both methods, but let's see which one's going to work best on the day. And let's see who's going to be the man on the day, because I think there might be just a little bit of pride at stake here. <laughs> The bagging waggler is quite an unsightly contraption, but as with all my angling approaches, I like to impart a bit of finesse. By this, I mean adding small strips of roofing lead to the frame of the feeder. All I'd do is crimp it around the base centrally. What this does is shot the float so there's only a small pimple showing as opposed to a large percentage sticking out the water. This is much better in windy conditions. So Alex, I've just had a chat with Mick about the sinking wag. And I must say, it sounds like it could work. How do you feel about the challenge? Well, I've got an old score to settle with him, so I'm well up for that. <laughs> Any time there's a bit of friendly rivalry involved, I'll be, I'll be there. <laughs> now, it sounds like a cracking method. Is it one that you've used before? Yeah, um, not as much as I have the floating or traditional bagging wag style, but the sinking waggler certainly has its merits. So, do you think today, with conditions how they are, do you think your method's going to work best? Oh, no, I'm the underdog. Definitely <laughs> the underdog. Are you just making excuses now? <laughs> <laughs> so moving on, rods and reels. I mean, this is another key factor, isn't it, with the bagging wag? Because I know traditionally people use barbel rods and stuff like yeah. that. Um, what rod are you using today? <clears throat> this rod's actually um, a Beastmaster twin top. So it comes with like a really heavy Avon type top and a sort of pound and a half, pound and three quarter top. And it's the latter of the two that I've chosen, the pound and a half top for bagging waggler fishing. As you can imagine, a loaded bagging waggler is going to weigh, you know, roughly five to six ounces, which is quite a lot of strain to put on a rod. Yeah, so, so you need something with plenty of power. Some a bit more beefy then, basically. Yeah, exactly. And the tw it's twelve foot six in length as well, which gives me plenty of uh, sort of plenty of casting power, really. Brilliant. And this is actually a bagging wag rod, is it? Yeah, it's one of its functions. It can be used, for, you know, for all sorts of things as well. But yeah. So what kind of action are you looking for? This one's actually got quite a tippy action with plenty of power through the middle, which is helping me punch out that heavy weight. That's yeah. the sort of action. I mean, ideally, a rod that bends right the way through from the middle is brilliant as a fish playing action. Now, Mick's using a different rod, isn't he? Yeah, he's actually using um, a heavy feeder rod. Um, I mean, that's, well, standing well up to the task for him. Yeah. Well, moving on to the reel, that's obviously a bit bigger than what, you know, a lot of anglers are used to. Yeah, this is almost what I would call a, a mini big pit reel. So taken sort of from the specimen carp styles of fishing, you'll see it's, you can get an awful lot of line on here, which helps when you're casting quite a long way with a bagging waggler, which is often, some, well, I say often, sometimes necessary when the fish are a long way out. I've actually spooled it up with 10 pound drag line right to the lip, so it flows off the spool really easily. So that just aids with the casting then? Indeed, yeah. Because you do see, I mean, that is a mistake that I see a lot of anglers make, that they don't put enough line on the reel. Yeah, it's, it's, one, it's something that's really simple to sort of combat and it will improve your angling. Brilliant. Well, Mick's definitely putting a few bits of ground bait out now, so I think I need to let you get back to it and get fishing, because otherwise you're going to get a right batter in. I'm ready for it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Make another fish on? Yeah, I got another one, yeah. You had a few bites, haven't you? Yeah, it's working well, this sinking bag in Wagler. Yeah. It is working well. Now, that brings me on to something, actually. Like, with the conventional bag in Wagler, obviously you can see any sort of bites. Yeah. How do you strike? What What's the crack? Well, you, you don't strike. You know, you, that's why I've got a rod rest and Alex hasn't, um, because on this method, you, you sort of put your rod down and wait for your tip to go around as if you was fishing a feeder. 
So you, you're fishing basically at a slight angle then to the float? Yeah, yeah. And Alex, Alex is so, sort of striking his or, or just watching his float, you know, to catch a fish. So do you, for Alex's point of view then, do you have to strike hard into the fish? No, no, no. No, you don't have to strike hard. Most of the time you don't have to strike at all, but sometimes, you know, your float will go under and, you, and your rod won't get pulled out of your hand, so, which obviously means the fish is swimming towards yeah. you or, or whatever, you know. And you're playing it quite low as well, aren't you? You're not, you've not got the rod in the air. No, no. I'm, I'm playing it gently as well because these rods are, are really quite powerful rods, obviously, because you, you're casting out such a big weight. Um, so under the rod tip, you have to be really careful not to bully the fish. And just pull it out. Yeah. Because also you've got quite a big weight with the bag and wag as well, haven't you, above it? Well, yeah. That's a nice fish then, Mick. So Mick, like you said, you, you actually, well, it's, it's a pole bar you use, not, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you're very comfortable out how you sat and everything seems to be to hand. Do you think that's a really important? Yeah, so important, yeah. It, I mean, I've got a really big side tray. You know, it's got everything on it that I need, pellets, hook baits, boilies, um, my ground bait, you know, it, spare catapults, just everything's there for me. So, and it makes things so much quicker as well as being easy, you know. I suppose that's crucial when you're match fishing, isn't it? Everything's to hand. Yeah. Speed fishing and yeah. being in that rhythm yeah. almost. And I've got a side tray this side as well with other bits and pieces on. God, there's know. a lot of space. I mean, Alex could almost, he could live on that, couldn't he? It's big enough. <laughs> yeah. He could put his one fish on it anyway. Yeah. Well, he's just had another one, so I think it's about time I leave you to it because there's not, not much time left now. So right, okay. I'm going to leave it to it and get cast in again. All right, cheers. There's no room for complicated baits when it comes to bagging waggler fishing. Both Mick and I keep our choices really simple and our approach revolves around using boilies and hard pellets. What have you chosen to use today, Mick? I've chosen to use uh, eight mil halibut pellets, uh, which is attached with a little pin. Okay, a bait, uh, a bait in it style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a bait pin. And um, the best way to attach it is get your drill um, and what you do is you put a little indentation in it first. Okay. Yeah, which actually stops stops the pellet from breaking in half when you put the pin in. So you've drilled, what, a mil into the pellet there? A couple of, probably three mil okay. into the pellet, uh, push your pin in and it, it won't break. If you weren't to drill the hole, what would happen? The pellet just snaps in half. Splits in half. Right, mm. that's a really good tip. Yeah. And today you found pellets have been the best hook bait so far? Um, no, I can't say they've been the best, but, but white boilie and pellet have been the best. And you found that throughout previous sessions as well? Yeah, sure, yeah. My choice today has been for 8 and 10 mil shellfish boilies. What I have noticed though is I've used a pop-up boilie, i.e. a floating bait, to counteract the weight of the hook. Instead of a sinking bait that would fall really quickly, once the waggler hits the water and the hook bait follows, this falls really, really slowly, which has definitely got me more bites today. So Mick, how do you fancy your chances against your best bud today? I don't fancy your chances, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Alex, conditions have completely changed now. That wind seems to have dropped and it's almost like a different day. Yeah. <laughs> Keep getting a bit of sun even. So I noticed that um, having chatted to Mick, he was saying that with his method, he knows when to cast out because basically he can see his float because it pops up. Yeah. But with you, it's a little bit different. H how do you know when to recast? Well, the bagging waggler is really a method for catching a lot of fish. So ideally you want to try and put quite a lot of bait in. If I'm having a good session, I'll be casting sort of every, even 30 to 60 seconds. Um, so you do, you're moving quite a lot then, aren't yeah, you? It's yeah, always, it's always cast out, twitch to float, no bites, wind in, fill it again, repeat the process. So you must use a lot of bait as well. Yeah, I mean, you can use sort of four to six kilos of ground bait uh, on a good session, but often the more you catch, you find the less you use because you're spending quite a lot of time playing fish. But what Mick and I have noticed today though, uh, having just said what I've said, is that we have had to wait for bites today. So it's not been a case of keep thrashing the float in and in and in. It's been casting it in, maybe wait two minutes, get a bite. But, uh, for what reason, I don't know. Is it just, it just a bit harder today? Maybe so. I mean, it, it, it's, it is flat now, which is in total contrast to the earlier conditions that we had. Um, and it just seems that maybe the fish have dropped down in the water a little bit. Maybe they're a bit, bit shyer. Maybe they want to feed at a lower depth. But for whatever reason, Mick and I have both found the same which is interesting. Just leaving it a bit. I noticed as well using your line clip on your reel. Yeah. 
You just cast into the clip then? Yeah, the reason I use the line clip uh, is twofold. Basically, the first reason is that it allows me to fish in a quite a tight area of the lake. So I can keep casting the float in the same place. Basically, the reason being that I can build the swim up and the fish know where to expect the bait to land almost. The second reason is because when the float is in the air, just as it hits the clip, it folds the float horizontally to the water. So basically it's landing sideways and that prevents it from diving in. Right, it's also creating a bit of noise I suppose as well. Yeah, it creates an awesome slap on the top, which <laughs> you know, fish associate with food. Yeah, so notice as well, as you're casting in, you're almost putting the rod to the side. I mean, do you feather it down like that? Yeah, what I do, so I've drawn the rod back, leaving a decent drop, so I can punch the float out, bring the rod up, and just ease the float in. Basically, I'm hitting the clip when the rod's up, up there or to one side. Basically, that eases the pressure on the whole rig. Um, if you cast really hard to the clip, it can actually cause a lot of stress on your mono, particularly where it's behind the clip. And also, if it hits the clip too hard, the bait can sometimes come off the bottom of the feeder. It also brings it out of where you're fishing as well, doesn't it? Because it can bounce back. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Now, if someone was fishing the method, they'd tuck the hook bait in the ground bait. And obviously, we've got the method on the bottom of the bagging wag. Would you ever tuck your hook bait within that? Yeah, I mean, it is something I've tried, um, but never something that seemed to really work, which is odd because you think a hook bait falling from a ball of feed would be more attractive than a hook bait separate from a ball of feed. It'd almost look more natural. Yeah, but I mean, I guess it could help if you're fishing really deep, like sort of really long hook lengths, it might help with your casting then. But it's never something that I've really um, had a lot of success doing. So you've wound in now then, talk us through how you would cast out and what you would do. Okay, well the first thing, because I'm using a bayonet, it's a real simple job of just pinning a boilie on. Basically that will last for sort of, well, almost until you catch a fish usually. You don't have to keep changing your hook bait every time. The next job is just to squeeze the mix around the frame. Just nice and compact, this is quite dry. And it comes off the feeder really quickly. You don't want to overload it either. No. Make sure you don't hook your box in the process. <laughs> leave, a, leave a reasonable drop so you can have it cast out accurately. Let the float hit the water. You'll notice, as we've touched on, hit the line clip, the float folded over, it's now hit the water. So what happens is the mix starts to come off the feeder and creates a cloud. Because I'm using a pop-up hook bait that's counteracted the weight of the hook, I've got a bait that's sinking really slowly through the cloud. That's now been out there sort of 15 to 20 seconds. I've not had a bite just twitch the float, you'll see it just wobbles the float and the remaining mix comes off. I can see the remaining ground baits come off because the float's popped up slightly because of the weight of the mix is no longer on it. But not at a bite this time, it's been about 30 to 45 seconds. I'm straight back in, repeat the process. Well Mick's just put another one in the net and obviously Alex doesn't want a complete battering because he'd never live it down, so I'm going to leave him to it. Well, we've seen the same method fish today, but in two completely different ways. And I think for the way the day's gone, Alex, you seem to catch better when it was flat calm, whereas your method seemed to work better when there's a bit of a chop on the water. Right, yeah. Now, we know there's a bit of um, pride at stake here as well with the competition. And unfortunately, Mick, Alex just picked you to the post. Yeah, he did, yeah. So. I owed you that one. <laughs> yeah, I'll get you back. <laughs> get him back, back. Get him back at playtime. <laughs> right, well, you kept the two best fish back, but I think you better get them back in the water now. So, do you want to put them back, lads? Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Well done, Mick. It's been brilliant. Yeah, it has, thanks. Well, it was a method I thought I knew a bit about, but I've learned loads more today on this show, and I hope you have too. It's a method you've definitely got to try. This episode